Greetings. This is Dina Marie with Faith Moments, a weekly podcast where I proclaim and ponder our Sunday Mass readings. Again, I want to thank those of you listening on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks to the Hail Mary Media app for making that available. I would encourage you to download that Hail Mary Media app and be able to get so many great podcasts on a regular basis, including this Faith Moments. Those of you who might be joining me on YouTube, Great to have you joining us or tuning in on the Modern Day Radio website. It's just a beautiful gift to share the word of God. And here we are. We are in the season of Easter. We've just completed now the first octave of Easter. And what I love is if you have the opportunity, and I certainly encourage it, to get to daily mass as often as you can in your schedule and the schedule of the local Catholic churches in your area, that during that octave, one is you'll notice every day in those first eight days of Easter, we sing or say the Gloria. It is the extension of the Easter Sunday for an octave. We continue that joyfulness. We continue that liturgy in a special way through the prayers for those first eight days of Easter. And so to hear that Gloria sung or prayed every morning at daily mass through that first week of Easter is, it's just, it's a reminder because we haven't said the Gloria for the whole time of Lent. And the Gloria reminds us glory to God in the highest. And we are reminded of the glory in Jesus Christ. And so today is Divine Mercy Sunday. You'll notice behind me that image of Divine Mercy. I hope that you have an image of Divine Mercy. And if not, this is a great time for you to find an image of Divine Mercy. It's as easy as going online today and finding an image and and printing off Uh, But certainly to look at a Catholic bookstore, to go to your Catholic church, and there should be holy cards of divine mercy that you can pick up and, and have the divine mercy image placed in prominent places in your own home. It's very important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the weeks go on with Easter, but you can see those rays full blood and water, which gush forth from the heart of Jesus as a fount of mercy for us. I trust in you and the words, I trust in you. You will know that that divine mercy image is an authentic divine mercy image. If the words I, Jesus, I trust in you are included on that image. It's not an authentic image if those words are not found on the image, but please have one. And this divine mercy Sunday is such a special one. Let's get into the readings and you will continue to hear for the first reading of our masses, the Acts of the Apostles. And we go through so much richness of the early church history in these 50 days of Easter. It's it's really special. Sometimes we go back and forth in terms of chronological time when we read them. But again, keep that in mind as you're reading the scriptures and you're hearing the, the words of the early church apostles as they founded the church. And we culminate Easter, of course, on the birthday of the church. What is the birthday of the church? Pentecost, the 50 days at that 50th day at the descent of the Holy Spirit is the birth of the church. And Mary, mother of God, is the mother of the church. So, so much beautiful history and richness, and it all comes from the word of God. And so let's begin this second Sunday of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday, April 16th, with a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. 
Our responsorial psalm comes from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is everlasting. Let the house of Israel say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is everlasting. I was hard pressed and was falling, but the Lord helped me. My strength and my courage is the Lord, and he has been my savior. The joyful shout of victory in the tents of the just. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. The stone, which the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. Our second reading comes from the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and bring your hand, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe? Because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life 
in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the readings for Divine Mercy Sunday. And I'll go back a little bit to the readings, and then I want to share a couple of reflections that are in, in conversation with God, some really beautiful insights that I think that commentary brings. What I love in the Acts of the Apostles is we hear the beginning of the church. And if this was not true, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, uh, we wouldn't have a church today. But we have the Catholic Church, the church that Jesus founded over 2,000 years ago in fulfillment of the scriptures as the prophets had prophesied. And we have our faith today, regardless of all of the darkness, all of the wars, all of the persecutions against Christians, against morality, against the light. Jesus is on the throne today with those sacred, holy wounds. And so we do not need to worry and get all upset at the things that are going on that are so dark and dreary in our world. Yes, there are terrible things that go on, but let us not forget Jesus rose from the dead. No other person in any other faith has claimed that, has claimed to be God, has claimed to follow up on that claim with the truth and the resurrection. And so we must have a confidence and a joy in how we live and how we interact in the world around us. And look at the early Christians. What they did is what we might call today home groups or small church groups, or small communities. We have small faith groups that may start in our parish communities where certain families may come together on a regular basis. They break bread together. They eat a meal together. They pray together. They, you know, when it says here that they share resources together, I think about all of the folks that I know who are homeschool families, just as an example. And you may share babysitting. You've got kids that are about the same ages. So maybe a couple of moms need to go get some work done here or there. And so the rest of the kids are being taken care of by a few other moms. And we share in the load of the work of caring for our families in order to help one another. It's just a, an a common way and a very practical way of how we can share in community life today. But we hear that at the very beginning of the forming of the apostles, they're breaking bread. This is the Eucharist. This is daily mass. They are coming together for the liturgy, for worship, so that it was very important at the very beginning of the church founding to come together for daily mass. You know, and this is why the Catholic Church, we have daily mass offered in every Catholic church around the globe. They come together for prayers. This is what knits, this is what sews the community together is a community life bonded by prayer, bonded by the Eucharist, bonded on what our faith is in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And so they come together and they celebrate what is common among them and they meet in their homes. And I think about how today in our world, 2000 plus years later, how we are so isolated while we have the technology to be connected with all of our family and loved ones around the globe with whatever device you want to use, FaceTime, we have this technology, yet are we actually connecting personally, one-on-one -on -one with each other, in community, sharing our hearts? The technology has really distracted us in many ways. And they come together praising God. They come together with a sincerity of heart, it says. And what happens? The Lord blesses that. It says at the very end, the Lord added 
the Lord added numbers to those who are being saved. And so it's not that I'm going to add the numbers. Boy, if we do these things, we're going to add the numbers. No, if we follow the way of Jesus, the truth, the way in the life, people will be attracted to it. People will be attracted by how we live our lives. It's different. It was different in the days of, of the early Jews becoming Christians and those Gentiles joining them. And, and they started to grow. They started to grow. And they shared, they prayed, they worshiped. And the challenge can be for us today. Do you find and develop and grow worship communities within your worship communities? Yes, we come together for mass. And that is the most important thing. But within that community, do we take that and we continue to work in, we've got a praise and worship group. Do you have a prayer group? Do you have a home group? And you come together on a regular basis, breaking bread, maybe having a meal together, maybe breaking the word open, having a Bible study. These are things that keep us growing together in the name of Jesus. As the responsorial Psalm says, his mercy endures forever. This is the theme for Divine Mercy Sunday. This abundant love and mercy is for those who don't deserve it. Remember that. Remember that mercy, we only give mercy. Mercy is only given. If we, if we don't really deserve it, we don't really deserve God's mercy, but he gives it to us. And so are we willing to receive the mercy that God gives us? Peter, at least the letter from St. Peter, beautiful, beautiful words from St. Peter. I almost feel like I'm reading a letter of St. Paul because of the lengthy sentence structure. But again, in this you rejoice, although now for a little while, you may have to suffer through various trials. This is not, this is not a surprise to the early Christians that there would be trials, but that our faith, it's our faith. You can't take our faith away. You can throw us in a prison. You can persecute us and turn us into slaves. Think of all the saints that we recognize who are captured and taken to a foreign land and forced into slavery. You can take all of that. You can't take my faith and my belief in Jesus Christ my risen Lord, and to honor the revelation of Jesus. Although you do not see him now, see, we don't see him in the, in the physical body today, Jesus. We see him in his people. We see him in the community of Christ. But we believe in Jesus because of his word, because of the witnesses who shared, who were there at the tomb, at the crucifixion, at the resurrection, at the fire, when he ate fish and bread with the disciples, you rejoice, listen to this, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Do you live that way? Do I live that way? As you attain the goal of your faith, what is the goal of our faith? Salvation. That's our goal, salvation in all the things that we're worried about today. I've got on my calendar a list of things to do with little boxes to check off. I like to check off boxes. But really, I'd have to ask myself, did you write salvation on the top of that list? I didn't. But that is my goal. And I hope that is your goal as well. Beautiful gospel reading of the account of Jesus. What is he saying? Peace he realizes that these apostles are still fearful. They're still not understanding the full story. And he comes and he gives them actually the power of forgiveness in the confessional, as we talk about in the Catholic church, the sacrament, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them. Whose sins you forgive, Jesus is sharing. Jesus is sharing his power with the early apostles in a form of a sacrament. This is where the grace, one of his graces will flow through. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven and whose sins you retain are retained. Beautiful. 
the story of Thomas and, you know, he probably felt, can you imagine if, if for some reason, maybe he was going out to go get food for the disciples or he was running an errand and Thomas is the one who went out and he didn't get to have that encounter. And I bet at the bottom of his heart, he just thought, I really want to see the Lord. Those other guys did. I, I really want to see the Lord. And he says, I will not believe. But then Jesus in his mercy, right? He, he doesn't say, well, I'm just going to let Thomas sit in his, in his pouting. Jesus comes in great mercy and love and says, Thomas, now you come touch the wounds. Come touch these wounds. And Thomas didn't even need to touch them. He saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. And what did he say? My Lord and my God. Not only did he recognize Jesus, he recognized my, my God. This is the son of God. And he believed. Do we recognize Jesus? How do you recognize Jesus? Do you recognize him knocking at your door? Have you left your door unlocked so that Jesus can come in? You know, if we lock the door of our hearts, if we put up walls, we, we put up a barrier to Jesus. Not that he can't get through, but he wants you to invite him into your lives. He wants to be invited he needs that invitation because he is such the great God who offers us that free will. I want to go back to the early Christians and that example that we get from the apostles in this beautiful reflection. Actually, it's a reflection on Easter Monday, but it talks about giving peace and joy. And this is a time of joy in the church. Now, we shouldn't ever stop. Oh, okay, Easter's over. No more joy. It should always be joyful. But I think this is a great point that comes up in this particular reading. It says, to be happy is a form of giving thanks to God for the innumerable gifts he gives us. Are you a happy person? Are you grateful? Are you joyful? Where does your happiness come from? Joy is the first tribute we owe him. We owe God joy. The simplest, most sincere way of showing that we are aware of the gifts of nature and grace he showers upon us and which we thank him for. God the Father is pleased with us when he sees us happy and joyful with true gladness. You know, maybe just as we do these self-examines, think about Am I a joyful person? Do I have, or am I always so kind of thinking about the next thing and worrying about the next thing that I don't show true, authentic joy? Evaluate how you are with other people, with yourself. Are you a joyful person? How do you show that joy? And do you believe your joy comes from the Lord? Everything that we have comes from the Lord. Let us give thanks and rejoice. Do we recognize the Lord? And if we do, we should be a people of joy. We do great good around us with our joy. For this brings others to God. See, our joy leads people to Jesus. Joy is frequently the best example of charity for those around us. Let us remember the first Christians. Their life was attractive because of the peace and joy with which they did the commonplace things of ordinary life. You know, their life didn't change in terms of their vocation, raising families, needing to work and provide food and shelter for their families. That stayed the same. How they did it, the joy, the gratefulness, that changed with Jesus. They were families who lived in union with Christ and who made him known to others, small Christian communities, which were centers for the spreading of the gospel and its message. They were families no different from other families of those times, but living with a new spirit, which spread to all those who were in contact with them. This is what the first Christians were, and this is what we have to be. 
sowers of peace and joy, the peace and joy that Jesus has brought to us. That's from Jose Maria Escrava. Many people will find God behind our optimism. In the customary smile, in the cordial attitude, this example of charity to others, of forcing ourselves to flee from gloomy moods and sadness at all times and to remove their cause is particularly communicated to those closest to us. Certainly think about the domestic church, our own homes. Are you walking around gloomy and complaining and, and, and worrisome? Or are you joyful? Are you grateful? Are you looking forward to? Lord, how are you going to bless this day? To be more precise, God wants the home where we live to be a bright and cheerful home. Never a dark and unhappy place, full of tension and a lack of mutual comprehension. A Christian household must be happy because supernatural life leads us to practicing those virtues to which joy is so intimately united. A Christian home makes Christ known in an attractive way among families and throughout society. And that's what I want to close with as we enter into this Divine Mercy Sunday and we continue in the season of Easter, I have to ask myself, am I a joyful person? Am I projecting that joy in my own home? And as I walk out the door, as I go to the backyard, pick the weeds, get ready for the garden, do I live a life of joy? And do I trust and believe that that joy comes from Jesus Christ? Jesus, I trust in you. Have a blessed Easter Easter. Easter season and have a blessed Divine Mercy Sunday.